Liberal Equality. Excerpted from Equality, The Impossible Quest. Martin Van Krefeld. 2015. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. If the task of utopia is to sketch an ideal society, that of political theory is to understand the way real polities function and ought to function. The two are clearly related. Nevertheless, in spite of having a common origin in Plato, they are not the same. Like equality and democracy, political theory is a separate field distinct from both cosmology and theology originated in ancient Greece. Later, as democracy and equality disappeared, it was replaced by so-called mirrors for princes. As Machiavelli's The Prince shows, such works remained popular into the 16th century. The difference between mirrors and utopias was that they did not deal with imaginary societies but with real ones. The difference between them and political theory was that their purpose was to tell rulers how to rule, not to analyze government and politics as such. Except in so far as they targeted the high and the mighty rather than ordinary men and women, in some ways they resemble modern self-improvement works such as the seven habits of highly successful people. The leap from mirrors to modern political theory, and a huge one it was, was made by Jean Bowden. The years from 1562 to 1648 were punctuated by savage religious wars. First in France and the Low Countries and then all over Europe, Catholics and Protestants busily cut each other's throats. It was in the hope of putting an end to the wars and reimposing order that Bowdoin, a lawyer who at one point worked for King Henry III, wrote his famous Six Books of the Commonwealth, 1576. In this work he invented sovereignty and the sovereign. Sovereignty meant two things. The first was the need to concentrate all power in the hands of a single person or body. That in turn implied the cancellation of all privileges and a return to the kind of rule under which everyone had equal rights, or, though Bowdoin did not dare say so openly, no rights. The second was that all sovereigns, since they could not and did not acknowledge any superior above themselves, were equal. The old idea which lay at the heart of feudal regimes in particular, about some rulers being superior and others inferior, was false. Of the two ideas, equality among sovereigns proved more acceptable. By the late 17th century the Peace of Westphalia had turned it into an established fact. When Louis XIV, during the so-called War of Devolution of 1667-1668, tried to reverse it by demanding all kinds of lands to which he claimed the French throne held some ancient feudal right, all he succeeded in doing was to unite the rest of Europe against him. However, abolishing feudalism and achieving equality inside each state took much longer. The definitive theoretical step towards the idea that all men, not women, that was only to come many years later, are equal was made by Thomas Hobbes, 1588-1579. Hobbes was a lifelong bachelor who lived in the houses of the great and taught their sons. Embarking on the enterprise, one of the advantages he enjoyed was that early in his career he had translated Thucydides. A better way to master the topic can hardly be imagined. On the face of it, to associate Hobbes with liberalism, from the Latin libertas, is a strange thing to do. After all he envisaged the most absolute state in history in which liberty was merely the cracks left open between the sovereign's laws. The mystery, as it has been called, is readily solved. Like Bowdoin, Hobbes wrote against the background of a bloody civil war during which he was in fear of his life and had to seek asylum in Holland. The war provided definite proof that the days when God and religion could act as the basis of government were gone for good. How, then, to realize his goal, which was to impose order at all costs? There was only one thing to do, namely, to forget about God and go back to the beginning, back to the state of nature. In the primeval state of nature, Hobbes explained, everybody had a right to everything, which is the same as saying that nobody had any rights at all. In that sense everyone was exactly equal to everyone else. Though there be found one man sometimes manifestly stronger in body, or of quicker mind than another, yet when all is reckoned together, the difference between man, and man, is not so considerable as that one man can thereupon claim to himself any benefit, to which another may not pretend, as well as he. For as to the strength of body, the weakest has strength enough to kill the strongest, either by secret machination, or by confederacy with others, that are in the same danger with himself. And as to the faculties of the mind. I find yet a greater equality amongst men, than that of strength. For such is the nature of men, that. They will hardly believe there be many so wise as themselves, there is not ordinarily a greater sign of the equal distribution of anything, than that every man is contented with his share. Hobbes might well be speaking tongue-in-cheek, except that he is not. Men are driven by an endless quest for power that only ceases with death. Hence, the outcome of natural equality is the perpetual warfare of all against all. However, humans are endowed with reason. To avoid a war which would be ruinous to all, they have agreed to sign a covenant, or social contract. 
Under that contract they give up all their rights and transfer them to the Commonwealth, or state, or Leviathan instead. At this point Hobbes pulls a second great innovation out of his magician's hat. The Greek polis and Republic in Rome apart, in all previous civilizations rulers had ruled because, by virtue of the divine descent and or support they enjoyed, or their ancestry, or their wealth, they possessed greater rights than others. With Hobbes, though, the right to govern was transferred, not to a person but to an abstract entity. All the ruler did was to carry that entity on his shoulders and embody it. As the state, a mortal god, took the place of a person, or persons, inequality became superfluous as a basis for government. Inside it everyone was equal. What power one exercised and what privileges one enjoyed originated in the office one occupied, not in one's divine descent or support, or ancestry, or property. The principle of equality having been established, it proved to be dynamite. Over the next three and a half centuries it spread like ripples in a pond. As we shall see, in a sense it was even subscribed to by Hitler and the National Socialists. It is true that not everybody agreed with Hobbes that all men were made equal by nature and that the only way to prevent them from tearing one another to pieces was to set up an absolute state. In fact some, such as the English philosopher John Locke, 1632-1704, question both ideas. Reverting to some older ideas, Locke tried to derive equality from Christianity. At the same time he looked for ways to combine equality with liberty. The way to do so, he suggested, was to abandon the idea of a single absolute ruler. Inside the state, which by now was taken very much for granted, authority was to be divided among different powers. Each would have its own sphere, and they would balance each other. Most important of all, government was to be by consent of the governed. The people were to be given the opportunity to change their rulers when doing so suited them. In practice, liberal equality took a long time to establish itself even in England. For example, it was only in 1829 that the Catholic minority, which had been discriminated against since the days of Henry VIII in the first half of the 16th century, was fully emancipated. This measure paved the way to the abolition of many other hindrances and privileges left over from centuries of the Ancien Regime. Outside England two countries in particular proved susceptible to the message, the American colonies on one hand, and France on the other. In America the Puritans, while in many ways conservatively minded, at first sought to combine most of the different kinds of equality we have studied so far. That included equality before God, equality before the law, and socio-economic equality. In trying to achieve the last of those, they had the immense advantage of being able to divide a new country, or as much of it as they had acquired, among themselves. Yet they also wanted liberty. Since equality and liberty are, in principle, incompatible, such a system presupposed the kind of voluntary restraint only a community of saints can maintain. Not surprisingly, it did not work. Early on the Puritan settlements made their living mainly by scratching the earth. As they prospered and gradually derived a greater part of their income from industry and trade, liberty gained priority over equality as in many ways it still does in the United States. Socioeconomic gaps among the settlements members started opening up. With them came differences in political power. To the extent that decisions were not made in London, on the other side of the Atlantic, the colonies tended to be governed by oligarchies of rich men. Either they lived in the towns, as in the north, or else in the countryside, as in the south. Most did hold elections of some kind. But nowhere were they democratic in the sense that all adult men, let alone women, could participate in them. In most places the poor, the religiously dissident, or both were excluded, to say nothing of black slaves. The other country where Locke's ideas found a favorable reception was France. The American colonies were small, poor, and far away. Not so France, which for a century and a half or so after the accession of Louis XIV was the most powerful country in Europe. The king's motto, nec pluribus impar, not unequal to many, proudly proclaimed that fact. The feudal aristocratic clerical military state weighed heavily on the lower classes. Yet France was also a developing industrial and commercial country. It had many towns and a numerous, prosperous, well-educated, bourgeoisie. All of this provided a fertile field for receiving the message of equality, meaning in the French case, above all equality in front of the law and the abolition of noble privilege. The names of those who dabbled with equality read like a list of French Enlightenment greats, Voltaire, D'Alembert, Concordat, and Diderot, to mention but a few. Voltaire, while he did not often use the concept, spent a lifetime fighting against the privileges of the clergy and the nobility and trying to defend minorities, such as the Protestants, who were being discriminated against and persecuted. Jean Le Rond D'Alembert, 1717-1783, 1717-1783, was interested in equality between the sexes, a field in which he was later followed by the Marquis de Sade. 
Marie Jean de Concordet, 1743-1794, also wanted more equality in France. However, thinking of Sparta, he worried about the impact too much of it might have on culture and the intellectual elite. Diderot had a lot to say about the unseemly inequality between superiors and subalterns. And with very good reason, for he himself spent time in prison as a result of a letter de cachet, best translated as an arbitrary warrant for arrest, issued against him. Many of these famous Enlightenment figures interacted with each other and influenced each other. Their concept of equality was so much in the air that a form of it even penetrated the walls of the monasteries. Some monks were affected, their superiors would no doubt say infected, by the prospect of breaking down the barriers between them and ordinary people in the service of the nation as a whole. Still, the 18th century author who took the idea of equality further than anybody else was Rousseau. Like Hobbes, Rousseau was a strong believer in a primeval state of nature that had existed before human society was created and history started moving. Unlike Hobbes, whom he never ceased to attack, he did not believe in the war of all against all. Perhaps most important of all, Rousseau was a truly superb writer. His romantic, not to say sentimental, style appealed to far more people than Hobbes' dry, wry analysis ever could. In the Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, 1750, Rousseau painted a portrait of the state of nature with which he has been associated ever since. That fact, of course, says as much about his readers as it did about the author himself. Savages are not wicked precisely because they do not know what it is to be good, for it is neither the development of knowledge nor the restraint of law, but the calm of the passions and the ignorance of vice that keeps them from doing wrong. Echoes here of Genesis and the Garden of Eden, no doubt. They were, however, familiar with kindness for the unfortunate and for the weak. That was a quality Rousseau, anticipating De Waal, thought he could see even in animals. It is pity that, in the state of nature, takes the place of laws, moral habits, and virtues, with the added benefit that there no one is tempted to disobey its gentle voice. It is pity that is the origin of tenderness, love, care, and even, since mothers risk their lives for their offspring, courage. It is pity, too, that inspires in all men the maxim of natural goodness, namely, do what is good to yourself with as little as possible harm to others. Under such conditions, inequality is scarcely noticeable. And its influence is almost negligible. The true founder of civil society, and of inequality, was the first man who, having enclosed a piece of land, thought of saying, this is mine, and came across people simple enough to believe him. The failure to correct him was the origin of all crimes, wars, and murders. As populations grew the family, housing, tools, agriculture, and metallurgy made their appearance. So did specialization and the division of labor. More important still, people lost their innocence. They started seeing themselves through the eyes of others, leading to competition, vanity, influence, and authority. The march of inequality was jump-started. It has never ceased advancing since, giving birth to endless conflicts, revolutions, and wars. From these struggles the monster, despotism, gradually rearing its ugly head and swallowing up everything that it had seemed to be good and sound in society would rise. So what is the remedy? Rousseau's answer is found in the Social Contract, 1762. The community he envisages differs from Plato's Republic in that there is no division into classes. That apart, it owes a lot to its predecessor. In both cases it is hard to say where political science ends and utopia begins. Meeting an assembly, all the men in a community sign a contract. In it, they surrender the kind of freedom that nature has endowed them with. So precisely determined are its articles that, no sooner are they changed or violated by anyone than they are rendered null and void, so that natural freedom is resumed. It reads, each one of us puts into the community his person and all his powers under the supreme discretion of the general will, and as a body, we incorporate every member as an indivisible part of the whole. Immediately in place of the individual person of each contracting party, this act of association creates an artificial and collective body composed of as many members as there are voters in the assembly. The gap between government and civil society is closed. Only the assembly in which the general will finds expression and by which it is expressed is left. Since nobody has any rights outside the general will or against it, everyone is by definition the equal of everyone else. In this totalitarian democracy, as it has been called, the difference between freedom and unfreedom is abolished. Everything, then, depends on having at hand men, and, in their own way, women, who, out of their own free will, are willing to embark on such an experiment and able to live in the community of equals it would create. In his novel Emile, also published in 1762, Rousseau describes the way such people should be raised and educated. The details do not matter much. Guided mainly by his father, a master educator if ever one there was, 
the boy is introduced first to the physical world around him, then to the trade he will one day exercise, and finally to the world of sentiment. By sentiment Rousseau means the kind of understanding, feeling and attitudes needed to enable the individual to live in harmony with his fellow creatures without any kind of compulsion. All this is done gradually and by means of example, observation, and experimentation. Practice dominates, whereas books only play a relatively small role. Since discovering the world and becoming what one is constitute their own reward there is room for neither rewards nor punishments. Children are helped to glide into their own personalities, so to speak. So gentle is the process that they do not even notice it. From beginning to end, the objective is to preserve and foster everything in them that is natural. Doing so requires that people give up their birthright, i.e. the kind of freedom nature had given them. Rousseau's ideal community offers even less liberty and is less tolerant of individual differences than the sovereign who carries Hobbes' Leviathan on his strong shoulders. The latter, after all, is only interested in order. There is a paradox here. As with Plato, who put as strong an emphasis on education as Rousseau did, first people are given the most perfect education to help them become and remain what nature has made them. Next, on pain of being excommunicated, they must subordinate themselves to, and lose themselves in, the general will. In Rousseau's paradise things are taken to the point where everybody is obliged to wear the same clothes. Even if all of this were feasible, if that is the price of equality then who wants it? Considering his own system Hobbes, like Bowdoin before him, sees it as equally compatible with monarchy, aristocracy, or democracy. He himself favored monarchy, in practice, however, once the principle of equality had been established that of democracy was not very far behind. Had not Herodotus, writing over two millennia before Hobbes, seen the two as marching together, indeed all but interchangeable? Locke himself never explained how government by consent should work, an omission that is almost certainly not accidental. Had he been pressed to the wall, probably he would have said that, to enable people to change their rulers if they wanted to, elections were indispensable. He would have added that, to prevent mob rule, the right to vote should be restricted to a minority, even a small one, of property owners, as was the case in the England of his day. But how could one reconcile such a system with the kind of equality Rousseau envisaged? Outside the family, either everybody was the equal of everybody else or he was not. Government by consent, both of the kind that existed in Athens and of that which Locke proposed, is nevertheless government. The temporary power of one man, a magistrate, over others, citizens, still means that power is, albeit temporarily, unequally distributed. To square the circle, Rousseau introduced two measures. First, magistrates were to be chosen not by elections but by casting lots. Second, sovereignty was transferred to the popular assembly. Its decisions would reflect the general will in which individuals were supposed to submerge themselves. There were, however, problems. First, the idea of selecting any but the least important officials by lot is preposterous and unworthy of a serious thinker. Second, as he himself knew well enough, a system of this kind was only practical, if indeed it was practical at all, in a small community where everybody lived with everybody else face to face. The model he had in mind was the Geneva of his youth which at the time, it was about the size of some of the larger Greek city-states. This was ironic, given that Rousseau's own father had been forced to flee Geneva after being caught poaching, in other words, encroaching on the privileges his betters, in this case the rich Swiss oligarchs, had reserved for themselves. Perhaps even more than Plato's Republic, Rousseau's vision was destined to remain in heaven, or, if one prefers, in hell. Here on earth, others looked for other solutions. Ancient Greek democracy, practically the only one before the modern age, was of the direct kind. In classical Athens, all citizens were allowed to participate in the assembly. At one point they even started to be paid for doing so. Each citizen had one vote. All were entitled to address the assembly, and all could gain office either by lot or by getting themselves elected. Briefly, whoever would take a part in public affairs could do so. Pericles himself said that anybody who did not serve the city in this way was an idiot es, best translated as idle chatterbox. This was direct democracy in action. In point of creating civic and political equality among the citizens it has never been improved upon. What is more, and precisely because it did not seek to enforce socio-economic equality, Athenian democracy also offered more liberty than most polities, real or imaginary, before or since. However, in the absence of sophisticated means of transportation and telecommunication, direct democracy also meant that both the geographical extent of the polity and the citizen body had to be kept fairly small. Otherwise it would be impossible to gather everybody at the same place, present the various arguments, and take the vote. We know that the Athenian assembly met about once every three weeks and that, 
On one particular occasion out of many hundreds, 9,000 citizens were actually present. But that is all we know. The way out of the dilemma was representation, the method by which some people speak on behalf of others. Rousseau himself says that the idea comes to us from feudal government, from that iniquitous and absurd system under which the human race is degraded and which dishonors the name of man. Modern historians, perhaps because they do not have to live under it, no longer see feudal government in quite so bad a light. However, they do agree that it is there that the origins of representation must be sought. Many European countries had parliaments in which the three estates were represented. And what are parliaments if not institutionalized meetings of representatives? Many towns with their elected governing organs also made use of the system. In itself, representation did little to abolish inequality before the law, perhaps, indeed, the opposite was the case. Politically, too, inequality reigned. There never was any question of one man, one vote, let alone an equal right to hold office. Forming part of the lower classes, the great majority of people did not have any vote at all. Locke himself rarely spoke of representation. Yet as early as the opening years of the 13th century his own country had set up the mother of parliaments. Between 1683 and 1688 he could also watch the system in action in the Netherlands where, like Hobbes, he had sought refuge. Over there the estates general, as well as the estates of each of the seven provinces, was in full bloom. Quite apart from imposing some kind of control on absolute government, the great advantage of representation was that it provided a potential for combining equality, one man, one vote, with an unlimited capacity for demographic and geographical expansion. Modern India, a country of no less than 3.2 million square miles and 1.2 billion people, is able to hold regular elections. Though it is anything but democratic, so does China whose territory is three times larger than that of India. Rousseau himself was well aware that his vision of a small community was incompatible with the powerful territorial states of his day. It could be realized, if at all, only in the nooks and crannies that might exist between them. Celebrated as he was, this fact caused his ideas to be relegated somewhat to the sidelines from where they later emerged in a truly terrible form. Meanwhile, starting where Locke had left off, it fell to Montesquieu to work out the details. The keywords to look for in the spirit of the laws are separation of powers, democracy, and elections. Taking a leaf from the English system of his day, Montesquieu also suggested a bicameral legislative in which the two chambers would balance one another. And how was a system in which some governed others, albeit democratically, to be reconciled with equality? Simple, Montesquieu answered, equality means not that everybody should command, or that no one should be commanded, but that we obey or command our equals. As he recognized full well, in reality things were not so simple. But for socioeconomic equality, political equality was largely meaningless. Like Kyrgyz and Romulus, Montesquieu explains, were lucky. The former found a polity thoroughly detested by all its members, providing him with a unique opportunity to reform it as thoroughly as he wished. The latter founded an entirely new one. Both, though for different reasons, were able to make an equal division of property, meaning land, what happened to the previous owners Montesquieu does not say. Even so, their work was far from perfect. Maintaining equality over time is at least as hard as establishing it. Doing so requires a measure of frugality that was present in Sparta but not, Montesquieu says, in Athens. Solon, while in charge of the latter, had done his best to limit economic inequality by regulating dowries as well as other measures, but he only succeeded to a limited extent. As for Rome, it quickly outgrew any egalitarianism with which it may have started out. From these men, Locke and Montesquieu in particular, a straight line leads to the War of the American Revolution. Thomas Paine, the English-American journalist who, in 1768, anonymously penned the enormously popular pamphlet Common Sense, took it for granted that, in the order of creation, men were originally equal. So how did they cease to be unequal, and how did oppression raise its head? Government by kings was first introduced into the world by the heathens, from whom the children of Israel copied the custom. It was the most prosperous invention the devil ever set on foot for the promotion of idolatry. In imitating them and setting up their own monarchy under King Saul, the children of Israel both went against their own ancient tradition and sinned against the Lord's will. Next, they compounded the error by making kingship hereditary. Where there are no distinctions there can be no superiority, perfect equality affords no temptation. The republics of Europe are all, and we may say always, in peace. Holland and Switzerland are without wars, foreign or domestic. Contrast this with monarchical governments. Driven by pride and insolence, and always threatened by would-be usurpers of every sort, they are never long at rest. The one way to avoid oppression, then, was to institute republican government. To make doubly sure, both electors, 
voters, and representatives should be numerous and equal. We are getting very close, late 18th century critics would have said perilously so, to Thomas Jefferson and the American Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. While there had been attempts to institute equality before, nothing like this had ever been written to serve as the basis for a real-life government. In the words of the Great Seal of the United States, a novus ordo seclorum, a new order of the ages, had come into being. Jefferson's words could never have been officially adopted by the Continental Congress if conditions had not been suitable. Especially compared with Europe, a certain kind of equality, and even more so the idea of equality, did indeed prevail. The first reason for this was that a feudal society had never existed. That meant that dissent, and the privileges it conferred in other countries, did not count for much. Slavery apart, what lawful authority some people exercised over others was solely by virtue of the public offices they held or, in the case of indentured servants, a covenant both sides had voluntarily entered. The fact that indenture was always temporary diminished its impact. The second was the absence in many places of a powerful government. Always in theory, and often in practice, whoever wanted to could move west. Over there, a thin population and primeval conditions prevented strong hierarchies from being formed. The third was the lingering influence of Puritanism. It continued to insist on equality in front of God, unlike most polities at most time and places, most colonies had neither a state religion nor a powerful ecclesiastical hierarchy to enforce it. As important, in theory at any rate, it considered all work honorable. Nevertheless, already in 1774 socio-economic gaps among the inhabitants of the 13 colonies were extremely wide. The top quindle held 95% of wealth, whereas the next four only owned 5%. Jefferson himself was well aware of these facts. His objective in waging a prolonged campaign against the Federalists was precisely to prevent the gaps from growing larger still. By contrast, what made Locke, and even more so Montesquieu, so popular in America was precisely the fact that they had squared the circle. They provided, or were believed to provide, a way of setting up and maintaining civic and political equality without any need to extend it into the economic sphere as well. Paine himself had showed the way. He mentioned Holland and Switzerland as models of democracy, which by the standards of the day they certainly were. What he did not say was that both societies were socio-economically unegalitarian. It is true that there were no kings and that the aristocracy was relatively weak. However, political rights were concentrated in the hands of a wealthy oligarchy. Once it had been established, American democracy did indeed guarantee a sort of political and civic equality. The circle of those who enjoyed that equality steadily grew. First the restrictions which, in many states, prevented the poor and the dissident from electing and being elected were removed. Much later blacks, women, and those aged between 18 and 21 started marching, or were pointed, in the same direction. Today, the major exception is the system whereby each state, regardless of how large or small its population is, sends an equal number of representatives to the Senate. Civic equality has also been expanded. Minorities such as gays made advances and were, to some extent, put on an equal basis with the rest. Through all this there could be no question of socio-economic equality, let alone frugality. Depending on which set of figures one chooses to believe, and which starting point one selects, socio-political gaps have remained largely unchanged. In 2008 the top quintal owned 89% of the country's wealth. The other four made do with 11%. The constitution itself can be interpreted, and often has been interpreted, as a document deliberately designed to enable the rich to retain their property while keeping the poor firmly in their place. The American version of equality, combined with democracy, also brought other benefits. Unable to extend citizenship, in other words give the people of its subject cities rights equal to those its own citizens enjoyed, Athens had to rule them by force. Incorporating foreigners as they did, other historical empires, however much they differed from Athens in other respects, also used force. The situation of the U.S. was, and is, entirely different. Thanks largely to the principle of representation, throughout its history it has only governed very few people who are not citizens. Over time, even the Indians have somehow been incorporated. It speaks volumes in favor of the system that the vast majority of people would not exchange their U.S. citizenship for any other. Conversely, in over two centuries since 1783 many millions have done what they could to obtain it. This success was by no means self-evident. Like Thucydides, both Locke and Montesquieu had worried less democracy, and the equality on which it was based, 
would lead to instability and sought to avoid it. Montesquieu even doubted whether a democracy larger than the Athenian one was possible at all. The example he and many of his contemporaries had in mind was Republican Rome. As it grew it lost any democratic elements it had ever had, turning into an empire ruled by despots instead. In response, Jefferson wrote that the principles of compact and equality would enable the U.S. to expand far beyond the ancient democracies. His prediction turned out to be more correct than he could ever have foreseen. The American version of equality has made possible a very large republic indeed. The major, major exception of the Civil War apart, in domestic policy at any rate that republic has also been a model of political stability. In almost 25 decades there have been no coups, not even attempted ones. Even the assassination of a few presidents and the impeachment of one of them have not prevented power from being transferred in an orderly manner. The constitution itself has been modified several times. Much of this is due to equality, meaning that no part of the population was able to lord it over the rest. The US did, however, fully meet Plato's description of democracy as feverish. The more it grew, the more it turned into perhaps the most competitive, dynamic, fastest changing, society the world has ever seen. The more it grew, too, the stronger its tendency to engage in foreign adventures or, as George Washington called them, entanglements. Since at least the early 1960s, most of these adventures have been foolish indeed. Not one did anything to advance America's interests, and several have ended in resounding defeats. Though the countries of the old world also moved towards equality, with them the process took very different forms. The major reason for that was the existence of centuries-old feudal privileges which could not be abolished without a struggle. By and large, the further east one went the greater the obstacles and the longer it took to remove them. Initially the country most affected was France, home to many of the most vociferous Enlightenment thinkers. Here as elsewhere, the gap between the prevailing conditions and those Rousseau had envisaged was enormous. The National Assembly, consisting of the representatives of the French people, in their 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Men only went so far in its attempt to correct the problem. Article 1 said that men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions can be based only on public utility. Article 6 explained that all citizens have the right to participate personally, or through their representatives, in, the laws, formation. It must be the same for all, whether it protects or punishes. All citizens, being equal in its eyes, are equally admissible to all public dignities, positions, and employments, according to their ability, and on the basis of no other distinction than that of their virtues and talents. As in the US, though, there were limits. The aim of every political association is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression, Article 2. Article 17 put the icing on the cake, property being an inviolable and sacred right, no one can be deprived of it unless legally established public necessity obviously demands it, and upon condition of a just and prior indemnity. Jefferson's Declaration of Independence had nothing to say about property. In this it differed from its French equivalent. By promising to protect both equality and property, the latter contradicted itself. The contradiction, left-wing critics would say, was inherent in liberal equality. The subsequent history of equality in France was much more tortuous than in the US first came the reign of terror. Robespierre, who more than anyone else initiated it and was responsible for it, saw himself as a disciple of Rousseau. In his diary he called the latter a divine man. It was from Rousseau, that he took the idea that anybody suspected of opposing the general will, in reality, Robespierre own, at a time when the patrie was in danger deserved to be put to death. The outcome was that an estimated 30,000 people lost their lives, many of them for no other reason but that they had aristocratic blood flowing in their veins. Having appointed himself emperor, Napoleon left revolutionary civic and political equality intact. He also retained the system whereby people voted for parliament. However, so many deputies were nominated by the government that it did not matter very much. Acting on the centuries-old theory that aristocracy formed a natural bulwark against popular revolution, the restored Bourbons tried to reintroduce some aspects of feudalism. Those included a bicameral parliamentary system with a hereditary upper chamber, modeled on the British one across the channel, and a lower one elected on the basis of a very narrow franchise indeed. Their efforts did not work very well. In 1830 Charles X was deposed. The July monarchy, which lasted until 1848 and was headed by Louis-Philippe, in some respects followed in Napoleon's footsteps. That was even more true of Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III. Having been elected president, he followed his uncle in mounting a coup and making himself emperor. Yet it is important to note that both Napoleons always maintain the principle of one man, one vote. 
To that extent, political equality persisted. The Third Republic upheld both the principle of one man, but not one woman, one vote and that of equality in front of the law. Yet the 1871 Constitution was not the last word. Under the Vichy regime work, family, fatherland took the place of liberty, equality, fraternity. Both democracy and elections were abolished. Officials started drafting a new constitution. However, the German withdrawal of 1944 brought the regime to an inglorious end before it could be completed. Aside from the Vichy years, the above-mentioned principles were never seriously questioned. Under the Fourth and Fifth Republics they remained intact. Each year on 14th of July, Bastille Day, they continued to be celebrated. The French revolutions of 1793-94 and 1871, though not those of 1830 and 1848, were accompanied by massive bloodshed. In Britain things were different. While the 19th century movement towards civic and political equality was as complicated as in France, it was practically bloodless. The main reason for this was that the glorious revolution of 1688 had already done away with many, though by no means all, forms of civic inequality. The Reform Act of 1832 expanded the electorate but fell far short of establishing political equality in the sense of universal suffrage. The Chartists between 1837 and 1842 demanded universal male suffrage, electoral districts of equal size, and the abolition of property qualifications for members of parliament. To put rich and poor on a more equal footing, they also wanted MPs to be paid. Eventually all these reforms were realized, but only long after the Chartists themselves had disappeared from the stage. In 1867 the Second Reform Act again expanded the electorate. In 1908, David Lloyd George, acting as Secretary of the Treasury and wishing to pass a liberal budget, threatened to pack the hereditary House of Lords with large numbers of new peers. The House gave way and lost much of its power, thus marking another step towards equality. However, political equality in the form of universal suffrage had to wait until after World War I. As in the US and France, none of this did much to increase economic equality which remained about as pronounced as it had ever been. Britain has also remained famous for maintaining a kind of social inequality based not just on wealth but on education, manners and pronunciation. Germany during the 18th century was divided into over 300 petty principalities. Most were feudal and hereditary. Others, though no less feudal, were governed by officials of the Catholic Church. Either way, of equality, civic or political, there could be no question whatsoever. To make matters worse, the small size of many principalities made it harder than usual to distinguish between political government and the ruler's private affairs. The outcome was a peculiarly stifling atmosphere characterized by obsequiousness and groveling servility. As the Jewish-German poet Heinrich Heine later wrote, it was as if people had swallowed the stick their superiors used to beat them with. Starting in 1794, the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars brought some change to the western parts of the country. But east of the Elba, absolutism and feudalism continued to reign almost undisturbed. In Prussia, which apart from the Habsburg monarchy was the largest German state, change only got underway during the so-called era of reform that started in 1807. It did not originate from within, but was forced on the country by the smashing defeat it had recently suffered at Napoleon's hands. Some, not all, of the aristocracy's privileges were abolished, as was serfdom. Henceforward all Prussian subjects were free, and a considerable degree of civic equality was instituted. After 1808 Prussian towns, which previously had possessed no independence whatsoever, started administering themselves with the aid of magistrates elected by all tax-paying citizens. Yet an effort to set up a country-wide parliament, however restricted the electorate on which it was based and however high the barriers that prevented all but the members of the highest classes from serving in it, did not succeed. In this respect Prussia fell behind the German states farther to the west which never quite undid the French-induced reforms. Thus the situation remained until 1848 when another revolution broke out. Eventually it was suppressed, but not before King Friedrich Wilhelm IV was forced to grant a constitution. Even so, political equality remained a pipe dream. True, every adult male Prussian was now entitled to vote. However, the electorate was divided into three classes according to the taxes each person paid. Each class was entitled to fill one-third of the seats in Parliament. The way it was done, an upper-class voter was worth almost 20 lower-class ones. Only in 1867 did the North German Bund adopt equal universal manhood suffrage, and only in 1871 was the latter extended to the rest of Germany. To that extent, the dream of the 1848 German revolutionaries was realized. In Prussia itself the principle of one man, one vote, had to wait until after the fall of the monarchy and the establishment of the republic in 1919.
as in other countries the Prussian-German nobility during the 19th century, and to some extent even later, also continued to enjoy some other privileges. Perhaps the most important one was easy access to desirable positions in the military and the state bureaucracy. In Russia a large part of the population was literally owned by a relatively small number of aristocrats. Even after Tsar Alexander II finally liberated the serfs in 1861, inequality among different classes remained as great as in any other country. However, the 19th century drive towards equality went beyond the political and the civic spheres. Education was just as important. From the time of Plato on, many authors had seen it as the only possible foundation on which everything else could be built. On both sides of the Atlantic, throughout the century universal, compulsory and free education was greatly expanded. Much, though not all, of this was occasioned by the demand for equality. Not everybody could be a university professor, but at any rate it was possible to give everyone some kind of foundation on which he could later build. To use a phrase coined much later by an aide to US President George W. Bush, no child was to be left behind. The outcome was a virtuous cycle. Educated people demanded equality with their betters. Equal people demanded even more education for themselves and their children. All this was well and good, so far as it went. One of the most interesting aspects of the post-1776 drive towards liberal equality was the emancipation of the Jews. Throughout the centuries of the diaspora the Jews were regarded as less than equal. However, since the concept of equality itself was unknown or only played a minor role in social affairs, this fact did not create undue difficulties. Jews were just one of many groups to which special laws, favorable or unfavorable, were attached. The advent of the Enlightenment with its atheism and emphasis on equality caused things to change. Jews ceased to be simply the devilish enemies of a God who was himself losing importance day by day. Instead, and precisely because their basic humanity was granted, they became a blot on the landscape and a glaring eyesore. Their very existence put in question the anticipated progress of man towards equality. Hence the idea, the beginnings of which can be discerned during the last decades before 1800, that they should be freed from discrimination and educated. As one would-be reformer put it, having once overcome their clannish religious opinions, the Jews would cease to be Jews and become citizens instead. At the age of 25 Karl Marx, the son of a converted Prussian Jew, penned a paper in which he expressed the hope that in a reformed socialist state, Jews would be emancipated from their own objective nature and disappear. Famous anti-Semites such as the writer Paul de Lagarde 1827-1891, and the historian Heinrich von Treitschke, 1834-1896, agreed with him on this point. In one country after another, Jews received full civic and political rights. Legally speaking, they were put on an equal footing with other citizens. France emancipated its Jews in 1791. That did not prove the end of the story. In 1806 Napoleon emancipated the Jews for the second time. Naturally he took the opportunity to make a little propaganda for himself. Paintings showed him graciously handing over the relevant document as Jewish men and women, flanked by the appropriate Jewish symbols, thanked him profusely. Later still the reform gave rise to some difficulties because Jews could hardly speak favorably of Napoleon without offending the Bourbons who succeeded him. The Netherlands, which at that time were known as the Batavian Republic, followed the French example in 1796. Many German states did so between then and 1815. Later a reaction set in and full equality was only reached in 1869, the North German Bund, and 1871, Germany as a whole. Even so, Prussian Jews were not allowed to become officers. In Britain emancipation did not take place at once but took decades to accomplish. Not until 1858 did the first Jew, Lionel Rothschild, take his seat in Parliament. Not until 1890 were the last remaining restrictions on Jews, and Catholics, removed. In the US Jewish emancipation was carried out not by the federal government but state by state. It was only completed in 1877 when Vermont finally ceased demanding that officeholders take their oath in the name of the Christian God, thus ending all forms of official discrimination. In Russia as late as 1912 a law was passed that prohibited even the grandchildren of Jews from serving as officers in the Tsar's army. Emancipation had to wait for the revolution of February 1917. Again it is important to emphasize that civic and political emancipation did not necessarily mean that, socially speaking, Jews were really accepted as equals. Even in the US in the 1950s, employers looking for workers sometimes specified that they did not want Jews. Many country clubs did not accept Jews, and many universities had quotas for them. In the case of the former it was probably simple anti-Semitism. In that of the latter, it was because Jewish students were so numerous and so good that faculties felt overwhelmed by them. It is said that nowadays, 
the same kind of reverse affirmative action is being applied to Asian students. The persistence, even in the most advanced liberal democratic countries, of unofficial discrimination caused many Jews to turn to socialism. Only the latter, they hoped, would really remove the obstacles under which they labored and put them on an equal basis with everyone else. The move towards Jewish emancipation was anything but smooth, and in any case it only affected a relatively small minority. Nevertheless, in many ways it both typified liberal equality and represented the latter's logical culmination. Paradoxical as it sounds, the origins of this particular form of equality are to be sought in Thomas Hobbes' absolutist vision. By inventing the abstract state, the Leviathan, as he called it, Hobbes conceived of government without the various relationships between superiors and inferiors on which, except in the ancient city-states, all previous regimes had been constructed. From then on neither any special link with the divine, nor ancestry, nor wealth, meant that some people could claim greater rights than, or power over, others. By the second half of the 18th century equality had become one of the principal rallying cries of the Enlightenment. Some thinkers, notably Rousseau, sought to take it to the point where it not only resulted in the abolition of all institutions inside the community but led to the total loss of liberty. Much later, this came to be known as totalitarian democracy. Starting with Locke, most thinkers took a different path. Their goal was to combine equality with freedom. At the same time they looked for ways to adapt it to the needs of the modern territorial state. Hitting upon representation, a system that strangely enough had been carried over from the detested feudal Middle Ages, they laid the theoretical foundations of liberal democracy. The first states specifically designed to uphold that ideal made their appearance in 1776 and 1789. Much blood was shed and setbacks were not lacking. However, throughout the 19th century progress in this direction continued. This happened first in Europe and then, gradually and hesitantly, in other parts of the world too. Such was its impetus that even Jews, who for over a thousand years had been despised minority, were officially emancipated. The process culminated in 1948 when liberal equality was extended to everyone and formally enshrined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yet as considerable as the achievements of liberalism and democracy were, they did little to reduce socioeconomic inequality. So little, in fact, that many came to regard liberalism and democracy as mere fig leaves to cover its absence.